We really, really appreciate you. We have a lot of competing events today. We know that. And also a competing Muslim movie. Um, and so the privilege of having two Muslim events at the same time, uh, could no I, I've never seen that happen before at South by Southwest. And um, just shows how far we've come. And next time we won't do that, have two at the same time. But thank you guys so much for being here. Um, and thank you to MPAC and to the Hollywood Bureau, to Sue, who's back there, the Doris Duke Foundation for being a key funder, um, and the MPAC Muslim House. Thank you so much to all of you guys. Um, I'm Zorin Shah with ABC News. I'm a reporter there. And I tell a lot of stories. And I really push hard for Muslim stories whenever I can. Everything from the fun stories to, uh, you know, the, the, the Eve stories on Good Morning America to the slightly harder stories. I've covered a lot of stories about people in Gaza and really proud to say that one of the stories uh, was about a U.S. citizen there who was stuck there and just hours after we put him on television, he was able to get out. So just a testament to the power of television, the power of the media. And um, I want to start, we're going to ask these three folks, very, very accomplished folks, a lot of questions, but I want to start with you guys just to get a pulse of the room. Um, Raise your hand if you're a storyteller. All right, a lot of hands, about half the room. Raise your hand if you're a Muslim storyteller, if you identify as Muslim. Okay, a few folks. And raise your hand if you're just sort of struggling in this moment about telling stories about Muslims. Okay, a few folks too. Um, we're gonna try to make that a lot easier. Um, these three have told a lot of stories, um, very, very accomplished through a lot of platforms. And, um, and they have a lot to say. So let's get started. Um, if you guys can introduce yourselves and, and the stories you have worked on that you're really proud of and the stories you are working on. I guess we'll start with me. Awesome, like um, peace and blessings. My name is Amina Bakir Abdul-Jabbar. I'm a professor, director, writer, producer. Um, I've made a couple of films. One of the films I'm most known for is a film called Bilalian, which was done many moons ago, um, which is about my black and Muslim community and the establishment of Islam in America by, and how black people play a role in that. I also have another film that's out right now, you can check right into it, called Muslima's Guide to Marriage, which is also about a black Muslim woman. Um, I watched it, it was beautiful. <laughs> thank you. And um, so that film is considered one of the first, or if not the first, romantic comedy about a uh, Muslim woman directed by a Muslim woman, written and directed by a Muslim woman. And um, I said I was a professor. I'm a professor at Cal State University, Los Angeles, and I actually teach, uh, t you know, this is the work that I do is about making storytelling more equitable. I teach about Muslim women, I teach about uh, black people in Islam, and I teach about ethnicities and emotions in U.S. film, which is basically about looking at how race is um, portrayed in American cinema over 100 years. All right, good afternoon. Salaam alaikum, everyone. Welcome. We're innovating. We Muslims, we TikTok, we Instagram, we Facebook, we draw, we tell jokes, uh, we eat, we cook, we direct, we make your life delicious. Uh, we're still here. Uh, uh, we're not going back. No one's going back. Uh, inshallah, we're only going to go forward. Uh, my primary role right now is I drive a Honda Odyssey minivan. Uh, anyone? Am I only one? Only one? Okay, that's fine. I'm glad that literally no one else raised their hand in solidarity with me. Glad to see there's no allies in this room. Uh, but back in the day, my previous uh, life experiences included becoming a recovering attorney. I'm still licensed in California. Uh, haven't practiced in 10 years. I wrote and published a play. Had to do it independently. We could talk about it afterwards, uh, after 9-11. That somehow led to me writing a failed HBO pilot with Dave Eggers, My Foot in Hollywood. That somehow led to me publishing a think tank report uh, on Islamophobia uh, 12 years ago, which unfortunately has become more relevant now than it was 12 years ago, but that's where we are. Fell into television, had no desire to do television, married way up to a doctor, moved from California to DC, and I was building IKEA furniture, trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life 10 years ago, and Al Jazeera America called me and said, uh, do you want to audition to be a host for Al Jazeera America's show? I'm like, I'm building IKEA furniture. And then the person laughed just like you. And I'm like, oh, they don't think I'm serious. So I laughed also. I'm like, ha, 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 ha. And then two months later, I was on television co-hosting the stream. That somehow led to like doing commentary. Then I landed on CNN for a year. I pissed off all the right people. 
uh, during the Trump years, uh, and then I wrote a book, my first book, and then I should be writing my second book, but I'm actually driving my minivan. <laughs> so all this is stay. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. But thankfully, we have Khadija, who's the boss. So tell us what to do, Khadija. Okay. Well, assalamu alaikum. You're so funny, though, actually, by the way. That's hysterical. How do you follow that? Okay. I didn't do all of that, um, but, but I'll tell you a little bit about what I did do, actually. So um, I currently serve as Senior Vice President of ABC News. We are Overseas Business Affairs. Um, oh, and that... <laughs> oh, so sweet. Thank you. Well, mashallah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, um, I focus on deal strategy and where I focus on handling um, the deals across the entire network. So whether it be for people who are on camera, editorial staff, um, marketing, ABC News Studios, you name it. So we have a team of people on um, the business affairs side. I also oversee rights and clearances in the video source business, which is a P&L line that focuses on licensing our archival t content as well. Um, so that's a part of that's a part of my, uh, my my day job, I'll say. Then on the side, actually, because also I'm I sit on the green light team at ABC News as well. So one of the shows that we just greenlit recently that's in development now is called Muslim Matchmaking, which hopefully you all will see soon. Um, oh, you, I see people who know about it. It's great. Okay, awesome. Yes, with um, Maratha Films, and we're really excited about them. They did India Matchmaking. You may be familiar with that show. Um, and so I was really excited to be a part of the team to greenlight that show and to make sure that we could tell stories that are human of a human interest about Muslim Americans um, that were not stereotypical, that were diverse, that showed the complexities of Muslim Americans in this country, and at the same time, all the different cultural experiences that we all have, that we bring to the table. So that's actually really exciting for me. Um, but in my past life, too, I spent 25 plus years at Viacom CBS, now Paramount Global. I launched, helped to launch shows such as Dora the Explorer, Backyardigans, Diego, and um, Worked on some of the other hits, um, like SpongeBob SquarePants and some other crazy shows. Okay, I'll say that to say, I'll say all that to say, we also spent a lot of time talking about Islam for young people when I was in that role at Nickelodeon because the goal was for us to also make sure that we were inclusive after 9/11 in particular, and to make sure that we could actually have young people see themselves on television. So we did a lot of work with a, lot, a number of uh, c companies and agencies to talk to us better about, actually say, talk to us about how we can actually make program that was more palatable and better for young people um, and more representative of all of us. And then I spent some time at BET Networks, um, where I spent um, a good part of my time making deals, but at the same time helping to bring programming like Black Girls Rock to the screen um, for television, as well as um, the New Edition story, the Bobby Brown story, and some other ones that I worked on. So um, my career has basically, I've been on the bubble a little bit. I've done development. Before I went to law school, I was actually on the development side. Um, and I brought some of those skills also from being in the talent department to my work on the business affair side. Um, I am not a recovering lawyer. I actually, um, I'm, I, I play one on TV. Um, but day to day, um, I, people see me as a lawyer oftentimes, but to be quite frank, I'm really a trusted partner and a confidant with, with, with folks across the board. And so I work in the creative spaces, but I also work on the business side. So that's sort of my, my story today. Oh, you have more? <laughs> And you know what, I can say this because I work with you at ABC News. I mean, first of all, number one network in America, most watched uh, broadcast network. And um, you speak up a lot within that institution. And, and people hear it and people listen to Katija. And I'm just so proud to be with all of you guys. I mean, between the three of you, I mean, you guys have done everything. Documentaries, books, I mean, teaching in major institutions. Um, I mean, signing contracts and, and being part of reality TV shows in front of the camera, behind the camera. All of it, and we'll be around afterward as well if you guys want to ask questions, and then please, please do. Um, but I want to start with actually something you said in your book. Um, you said the New York Times portrayed is, uh, Islam and Muslims more negatively than they did cocaine, alcohol, or cancer, according to a study examined by the paper's headlines from 1990 to 2014. Have we made any progress? Tell us about the progress we've made. Well. The bar was very low, uh, and that was a study that was done. And uh, you know, when the religion of 1.7 billion people and the lived experiences of 1,400 uh, 1400 years and one uh, 1,400 years of Islamic civilization is uh, portrayed worse than cancer, I feel like you can only go up. And so we will talk very bluntly about many of the real challenges that we are facing now and that we have faced. But I think some good news, uh, you know should be present as well. 
uh, I'm just looking at this, 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 you know, just listening to the stories. I remember I was 20 years old, senior at UC Berkeley, when the two towers went down. People forget there was no Zorin. There was... Fareed Zakaria has openly said that he was unqualified for his job, but he was like the only brown Muslim guy at Newsweek. So they're like, Fareed, you be the voice of Islam. He goes, I'm secular, not really practicing, but okay. Um, we didn't have Zareen. We didn't have Mehdi Hassan. We didn't have Ali Velshi. We didn't have uh, Ayman. We didn't have Malika Bilal. Uh, we didn't have Miss Marvel. We didn't have Khadija in this type of senior role. We had Khadija going to law school. We didn't have Amina as a tenured professor. We had Amina as a grad student. And I could tell you at that time, we didn't have Muslim comedians. We didn't have Rami. We didn't have uh, Mo. Mo was just starting out with Allah makes me funny. So my generation realized with 9-11, looking at what other communities have gone through, especially black Americans. Oh, tag, you're it. You're the boogeyman. It's going to get rough. And my teacher, uh, Ishmael Reed, who's a MacArthur Genius winner, is a black man. Uh, he was my teacher at the time. He told me, two weeks after 9-11, you're going to get hazed for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Black people have gone through it for 400 years. Uh, the way we fought back is art, culture, and storytelling. So he's the one that told me to write my play mm -hmm. about a Muslim American family. So at that time, 22 years ago, Zareen, mm -hmm. we had people literally becoming lawyers for the first time. Mm -hmm. We had people going into academia. We had people leaving their jobs, their comfortable, it was, I always call it the immigrant trinity. Anyone want to know what the trinity is? If you're a child of immigrants, a doctor, lawyer, lawyer engineer, yeah. business, failure. That's it. Uh, so we had people like me choosing failure for the first time. So now you fast forward and it's 2024 and we could talk about the challenges. I know you're going to get into it. But the fact that we're in these positions, they call us rats, rodents, invaders, a swarm. Well... Rats get through, sure rats survive, mm -hmm. cockroaches survive, you know, you can't kill us all. Uh, they, you, they have to contend with our stories. They have to contend with our presence in the room. We didn't have elected officials. Now we have at least two, right? So when, when things get dark, and I said this at a, in front of a Muslim audience just last week, privileged audience of suburban Muslims who are <laughs> slowly being radicalized by what's happening, and they reminded me of the uncles and aunties after 9-11 who said the same thing. I've been in this country my entire life. I've done everything right. I paid my taxes. I worked hard. And they still see me as a terrorist. I can't speak up. I speak up, I'm going to get fired. And the anger and the rage and the frustration, right? Fast forward, 20 years, last week, privileged room of ballers, people who have made it. I can't speak out. I can't say anything. What's the point? They still see us as outsiders. They still see us as terrorists. There's nothing I can do. And I just wanted to give them the arc of where we've come from and how, where we can still go. Right. And it's a process. And, Professor, please feel free to weigh in. But, Khadija, I want, I want to ask you, I mean, you are, you are in these rooms that none of us are in. Um, are you seeing progress? I mean, what is the temperature and mood like? when you're talking about Muslim representation in these rooms, when you're talking about progress and moving forward? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I think um, I would say that I think there is progress. I think that there, we have a lot of allies who are oftentimes quiet um, initially, and when you speak up, you recognize how many people actually are, are speaking up with you. So, you know, I have found, like, I've, you know, Zoreen knows there's some things that, you know, that I speak up on that are, pretty like recent and also things that happen regularly um, in different points um, of um, the day. You know, it could be anywhere from, you know, who's on TV or who's not on TV, right? Um, making sure that we make sure we don't silence or censor people. Um, try my very best to, to call things out when I hear things being stated that I think are inaccurate or not, you know, representative of what should be um, communicated to the American public. So, um, People will say to me, Khadija, thank you for saying that. I wasn't going to say anything. I was a little bit nervous, but I'm glad you said it. I'm with you. Um, I think that we have to use our voices, and sometimes the question is, how do we do it? Um, you know, 
so that we don't ostracize people, but we build alliances, that's the key. The 52-year-old Khadija is different than the 22-year-old Khadija. When I was 22, I did things a little differently. I've learned a few things. So now I can figure out how to use my voice in a way that brings people together um, and not create walls, but really to build bridges. So I do think that we have opportunities, and we have to use our voices. We have to build alliances. We have to speak up, because if not us, who, quite frankly? And I will also say that it also gives other people the courage to do the same thing for their own situation. And oftentimes, to your point, it was African Americans one day, it was you know um, Arab, Arab Americans the next day. As Dr. King said, if it happens to one community, it will happen to all unless we say something or do something. So silence is the enemy, quite frankly. We do have to use our voices and we have to find ways in which to do it in a way that's palatable, but at the same time, that's courageous. And you say we have to use our voices. Professor, you work in education. It's an interesting time in education in this moment. Do you feel okay using your voice? Uh, do, you, do you see the progress in your institution? So I, I want to go back just a bit. I want to speak to uh, the September 11th conversation. I want to talk about how the, even the privilege of being able to not, um, to have to wake up with that event and see like, okay, you know, at that time I'm in grad school, I'm making a film Bilalian, which is literally about defining my community. And I didn't want to make that film. So let me be completely transparent with you. I went to UCLA f at this time. I'm I went to USC for undergrad for film, and then I go to UCLA. And I'm at UCLA, and one of my professors is it's the, uh, the big fire at uh, Hodge, and my father's in it. And one of the professors said, I was really worried, and they said, oh, your dad's not in real, he's, they're not in real Hodge. I was like, well, wh where do you think they are? He's at, in Disneyland Hodge? Well, they couldn't see me as a black person, as someone that could have a family member in actual, like, Saudi Arabia, right? So that brought me to the work of just book one, making a, a film about my community, right? So there I am, a student. That speaks to your point a bit, which is like, I, I, didn't wa I thought I was going to be making movies with Spielberg. Right. <laughs> You're not, right? The reality is... Film school is racist, right? And I had to basically create a lane for myself. We talk about innovative storytelling. This is where it starts for me, right? But this is where, where it speaks to the September 11 component. I'm editing that film on version one. My editors will know this. Version one of Final Cut Pro at this time. And I, September 11th, the event happens, and I'm afraid to put this film out because I'm like, oh, my God oh my God, you know, there, it seemed like there was some space for Muslim stories, but like Malcolm X told us, like the media is going to have us hating the wrong people, right? I'm from, I'm born in the nation of Islam. I know I could never, the privilege of being able to say, oh, you know, they like me, right? They, did, they, they don't like me and I'm here. And I'm not going anywhere, right? So yes, as a professor, to your point, I see our um, faculty advisor to the Muslim Student Association, I see the fear that the students have. And it's very palatable, right? I remember that fear as a student. Storytelling, for me, is a way out of that fear. And there's a different kind of fear also in this moment, other than you know, this, this current crisis happening in the Middle East. Um, we're talking a lot about 9-11. There's also that fear of this industry shrinking, right? I mean, you have the SAG strike. You have the writer strike. I mean, it feels like there's just so few jobs. Where are we in this moment, and how do we move forward from this, the inevitable happening, right? The industry just getting smaller and smaller. You know, I was going to say, yeah, I think that a lot of this is also... Um, the way that we respond to moments like this is demonstrative of who we truly are, right? Um, I, I think back to a lot of communities when there are challenges and struggles. What happens, it's not that we, um, what happens with them, I would say, is that they bond together. They figure out, like, how to coalition build, right? So the question is, like, how do we work together so that, so you can make your films and you have a tribe of people that are working with you, they're lifting you up until, in some ways, the 
industry opens back up again, so to speak, right? I think we have to think about, history is powerful to understand history and to understand what other communities have done when challenges come about, right? So instead of asking for other people to give us those jobs, maybe we create our own jobs. Mm -hmm. Instead of asking for people to give us like the opportunity to, to direct something, maybe we create our own films and we're directing them. And maybe we support each other and build alliances in that way. I think we have to really be thinking about creative ways for us to sustain ourselves. And if you look at history, a lot of other communities have already done it, right? Um, that's how we don't fall victim. That's how we don't become dependent on others. And that's also how we create our own lane. And then they will be coming and looking for us. They'll be calling for us. They'll be checking for us, right? That's how we have to operate. I think that's the spirit that we have to move forward with. And then in the same time, keep the bridge open. You know, I'm not saying we should close the lane, but I'm just saying we have to have parallel paths to this experience. And we have to also recognize where we're at in this moment. But at the same time, we talked about this a little bit earlier, Zareen, really like be ready. Always be ready. Yeah. Be prepared. And that preparation looks like doing the work that is required to be ready for the big stage. And the big stage doesn't mean it's the stage that somebody else creates for us. It could be the stage that we created for ourselves. Can I, I, I just want to give it a, a, an example of what we were talking you about. You don't have to ask permission as a token male, by the <laughs> way. No, I mean, I just wanted to. I'm not token. I am the token, I am the sole representative of all Muslim men and all South Asian men. And oh. the power invested in me by myself. Let me give the authoritative word. Uh, no, I, you know, just listening to everyone, it's so interesting how we have such different backgrounds, but it's so similar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking about innovation, right? And so crisis sometimes bring us, brings about opportunity. 9-11 yeah. was a crisis yeah. for our communities. Right now what's happening in Gaza is another crisis for many of our communities, including yep. Jewish American communities who are allies who are stepping yeah. up, right? And just to give an example of what Khadija said, I'll share it just, to, just for young storytellers here how to innovate in a moment of crisis. Uh, I was independent. I realized I wouldn't get those opportunities. I wrote that play. I thought it was a very good play. I was told 20 years ago that the mainstream, which is code word for white, would not invest in an ethnic story. Ethnic means darkies, all right? So the whites won't invest in these darkie stories. They're not white, they, what, what is, what is, how will they invest in it? And I believed if you tell a good story, they'll line up. Just like I think if you give them a good meal with merch and masala, they'll eat that good meal and not the shitty food that they get in Pakistani Indian restaurants. You just have to give it to them, right? And they're like, it's too spicy for the whites. I'm like, I have faith in the whites. The whites will cross the road, right? I've always had faith in the whites, the mainstream. And so I remember after 9-11, I had to create my own IP. I had to do my own play. So if you're a storyteller in this moment of crisis, I would say, if no one's giving you permission and no one's helping you out, go do it yourself, right? Once you make that IP, that independent uh, intellectual property that you own, right, then you need allies. And I remember the allies at that time were my professor, who's African-American, his wife, who's a Jewish-American. He became the first producer. She, she became the first director. I went out to my community to cast the play. My community at that time laughed at me. And said, Beta, why are you doing this useless play thing? Go become a doctor. Go protest. Exact quote. I did the play at Mehran Pakistani Indian restaurant. Now I'm making this up. Raise up the funds. If you get 50 people to come to a stage reading, it's a success. We got 350 people. Got, did everything ourselves. Learned the skills. I never in a play. Wrote a play. Became a producer. Assistant director. Like, you know, stand-in actor. Uh, did the promotion. If you build it, they'll come. Proved that this could make money. At the end of the day, the color that dominates all other colors in America is the color green. Mm. So for people of color, you can learn from black folks, you can learn from Italian folks, you can learn from Jewish folks from back in the day. You know, we have to do everything, it's, it's like Daft Punk, you have to do everything harder, better, faster, stronger, smarter. It is the way it is. But in our communities, there's resilience and there is opportunity. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna push back on the color green though, because I think about, you know, Aziz Ansari. Raza Aslan, Mehdi Hassan, Hassan Minaj. I mean, a lot of them byproducts of that 9-11 moment, right? Who rose, and some of their supporters may say they were given wings only to be clipped off when they got so high, when they started soaring, right? I mean, is it really that the color green trumps all? Or, or how do you feel I about have an that? answer, but let Amina go first, because yeah. I know she's... Okay. I was going to talk about, um, basically, I was going to quote uh, Elijah Muhammad when he said... Uh, one of the 
a founder of the Nation of Islam, or one of the founders of the Nation of Islam, when he said the gold is in the fish's mouth. So what that means is that, you know, the people have the money, right? Get to the people. I don't worry about, you know, I, I don't worry about, like, the audience component. I have, I make a film. The other day I was somewhere, I was at a funeral, a janaza, and someone said, oh, what, what, what's your next film? What's your next film, right? I make a film, they come. I took a film across the country. I had, I, I, I had to stop going out with the film. I, had to, I was in the middle of a divorce. I'm married again. There's my husband. But um, I was like, I, I need a break. The Muslims, they want to see the movie. You said 1.2? 1 1.8 billion. It, come on. That's the green and the gold, right? But I was only saying that to say that, you know, the reality is that eventually Hollywood did show up, okay? I don't know if this speaks to the point. Eventually, my friend from film school calls me. He's like, yo, you know, and he, I'm, he's re recommending me to get a, an agent and a, ma a manager, right? And so he's a writer on SNL, or at that point, he had a TV show. And he's like, come meet with someone that's executive on his show. And I'm getting management. And this is like 20, almost like 15 years after my, my first film. And I have another film out, Muslim's Guide to Marriage, at that point. And I realized, like, if the goal is Hollywood, it's going to come, because you said the green, right? But the reality is, I actually would like to push back against this goal and say, what about if we look at it differently? If we think about the audience, we can get to the audience. That's what the shrinking to me is like. If you, it, it, The shrinking is going to happen, but the reality is the people. It's one point something billion. I can get to those people. And I remember I was in New York, and a woman came out, and she said, I'm showing my film at a theater. And she says, this is my Black Panther. I have a response to you, but uh, oh, uh, look, Khadija, please go first. You were such a oh. polite, polite. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, no, no, you go right ahead. I'm good. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. the response is the following, is there's systemic racism in America. And you talked about the wings being clipped which uh, is a great metaphor. It's something I told my wife yesterday, actually. I told her, I said, uh, about my career, I said, well, just things that happened in my life. I'm like, I should have gone supernova. All these opportunities, all these people, and I felt like, oh, just my wings got clipped, but I keep going. My wife's like, keep I married like an awesome woman. She goes, keep going, keep going. And I see my friends, Mehdi Hassan, wings got clipped. Hassan Minaj, wings got clipped. And all these talented people who just never got the opportunity. I've traveled the world. Talent is common. Opportunity is not. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, women and people of color don't get the opportunity. We don't have the mentors. If you look at power, you know, New York Times did this after George Floyd. They said, who has power in America? They went to every single industry, and they did a photo of the faces. 92% were white. Wow. And you know, when the DEI happened, the DEI explosion, all people of color in the WhatsApps were like, this will last six months. Mm -hmm. And it lasted six months to a year, and the backlash has begun. Like you saw in Florida, they just... Kill the program at the University of Florida. And you could sit there and get so angry, but you have to be a student of history and connect the dots. And I'm at that age right now, 42, 43, where it's middle-aged and you bury people and you bring people to life. It's called the sandwich years. And it's giving me a perspective on life, my ancestors, the young kids. And you sit there and you go, this is the arc of American history. It's always been this way. And Professor Carol Anderson wrote this great book called White Rage. Wait, do the same people get brought up alive when they're when they're buried? No, but different saying, people. You know, what I'm saying is, it's like well, Khadija mentioned, it was black people, it's Arabs, it's Muslims, it's trans, but you know, Professor Carol Anderson did this really great book, it's 250 pages, where she says every time there's been progress, especially for black folks, but any minority community, two steps forward, one step back, that is American history. So the rest of us at this moment in history, we have a choice to make. Do you retreat in the corner and be silent to be safe? You could. Or do you push, you stretch, you expand? It's going to be tough. It's uphill. But to quote Daft Punk, we've always had to work harder, better, faster, stronger, smarter. And I'm at that stage in my life where I think about, you know, speaking about as a 43-year-old now, being in the game for a long time, I'm like, there's less years ahead of me than behind me. Roger, you're not that old. But still, I, you, 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 <laughs> but you think about this, right? You get to my age, you think about this, and I go, but I have three young kids. Caramel mocha skin kids with multisyllabic names. Because if I was named Wajahat, damn it, they have to suffer as well. But, you know, I think, you know, I, I think about it. I'll be damned if I, the inheritance I give them will be, you'll be good victims. Right. Just smile with your white teeth. Be the good moral minority. So for me, it's like, I think about this because of my age now. I'm like, I have to make sure that what I leave them 
is, is a legacy of hope and success and that they saw their Baba at least pushing. So, oh, could, could you, I think you had something no, to say. No? no? No, I'm good, actually. I, he said it all. I'm good. I'm, good. Yeah. I'm from South Central. Like, you going I'm going to die on my feet. Like, I talked about this in the, um, in, the, in the prep for this. I'm like, I have tenure. You know, you can't kill, you can't fire me. But, you know, I get a death threat regularly. So, I'm, you, they're, they're, they're going to try to kill us, right? So, it's a little bit different. Like, what will you die for? Like, are you ready to die for your story? So, I mean, I'm only saying that to say that, you know, I can't take my skin off, right? So I've had my experience, you know, my father is a, um, an author. He wrote a book that got turned into the movie South Central, which was produced by Oliver Stone, executive produced by Oliver Stone. And my dad, I remember him typing on a computer, gang war outside the door, right? Rocking the hijab. I'm real Muslim. I'm really Muslim. You could t I'm telling you, like, we wore the scarf when it wasn't popular, right? So... What I'm saying is, like, for me, I saw my father go through this, and I remember when he distinctly said, he wanted to, he, he said it one time, I heard him say, I wanted to make a movie, so I don't live that far from Hollywood. And he made a movie. Right. It's, I think, Khadija, you brought this up, the component about if, if God wills it, right? If God wills, that's right. Yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. Well, be and it is, right? Even as Allah says, be and it is. It's just that simple, right? I mean, how many times in your own lives have you seen situations where you thought you were down, you thought you were powerless, you thought you were out, and then Allah was like, wait, no, not so fast. Be and it is. That's all it is. If the reality is that the, a lot of times, you know, we don't even know our own power. Zareen and I was having this conversation earlier, and, I, and to your point about power earlier, you know, those are the people that the New York Times, you know, show has power that have power in the sense that we understand power to be, right? But the reality is that we all have power. That's the reality, right? And when we tap into our own power and our power sources, we start to realize what we really can do. So the truth is that oftentimes we're our definition of power looks one way. It's what we've been taught to believe power is. But that's that's a trap. It's a trap, right? When you flip power and definition of power that you've learned for all these years on its head and understand that you always had power, that you always, you, and you still do have power, quite frankly. When you start to see it that way, then you start to realize, oh, oh, I see. It was a mind game. It was all a mind game. And so for me, it's like, so, like I mean, I grew up in Harlem. I was born to the Nation of Islam, too. My family converted to Orthodox Islam in 1975. And, and, but the thing about the nation, I will tell y'all, that's interesting, people always give us flack for, but I'll tell you one thing about the nation. I was born and raised to believe that I was a self-determined young woman from the outset. I was, I was taught to believe that I had power. And black power, black excellence, and all that stuff, those are things that I really believed. I was indoctrinated and inoculated with that vaccine early to say, guess what, girl? Um, the world's against you a little bit. Okay, but don't take it as if you can't be in the world. It just means that you have to understand what the world is, that you weren't really made for this world as it currently is, you know, constructed. But it didn't mean that I couldn't survive or, more importantly, thrive in the world. And also didn't mean that I couldn't succeed in the world. And so I took my experience in Harlem growing up in the housing projects of Manhattanville, quite frankly, to understand that it just meant that I was born into that circumstance at that moment because God understood that I had the power and he was going to lift me up in a different way. Right. And so when we all recognize that we have our own stories to tell, we're all storytellers, quite frankly. Right. We, we are the masterminds and the authors of our own story. We create the scripts and the scripts are our lives. Right. And so when we get to see that that script, that story that we're telling, we're writing it every day. We pin it every day with the choices that we make and the decisions that we make and how we show up and what we don't take and how we help other people, and how we extend grace to people who may need to understand us. Some people just don't understand who we truly are sometimes. So I give myself the chance to talk to people. I make a, a point to make sure that I give people a chance to ask me the kinds of questions that they probably are too afraid to ask somebody. Because sometimes it's just grace that we have to extend each other, quite frankly. And, and you, that's where the allyship comes in. And you said I could plug this, so I will. Yeah, so yeah. Katija's actually writing a book about this very topic, about power. And so... Stay tuned for that. I'm very excited about it. Well, right that. now it's power redefined, but be on the lookout. If, it's, if it says something else later, we'll let you know. But <laughs> I, I feel like uh, we have to just bash CBS, NBC, and Fox because we have two ABC folks here. <laughs> you don't. So just well, watch ABC program. No, you don't. You don't. They don't have, they don't have, they have no, very few I grew up on TGIF. Muslim women, right? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Family Matters? Step by Step? Wow, he look at him. He knows all the shows. <laughs> can, can I can I mention something which is the elephant in the room, real yeah. quick? That that uh, we should talk about it, bringing things full circle, is uh, 
and everything, you know, I co-sign everything with, uh, which uh, Khadija and Amina have said. It's so interesting to listen to people's other life experiences and just be like, plus one. Uh, you know, th that to find the strength in your own voice, to, to find the strength in your own story as the world says your story doesn't matter. To imagine yourself as the protagonist of the hero even though you've seen yourself as the villain or the sidekick or the punchline or worst of all, rendered invisible. And I always ask audiences, what's worse, to be the villain or to be invisible? Because at least the Joker has a speaking part and gets the Oscar. Like any actor who plays the Joker wins the Oscar, right? But when you're invisible, you don't exist. And we, you know, bringing back things full circle, I'm just going to address the elephant in the room. What's happening in Israel and Gaza the last four months, five months. I can tell you it's, it's, a, it's just fascinating because the same thing that happened to me as a storyteller 22 years ago is happening now. I can share with you, as I shared with Zoreen, I have lost at least three gigs because I'm Muslim and because I've asked for a seat. I've never even said anything radical. I said, you know, I'm critical uh, against what uh, Netanyahu's doing. It's too much death. We should have a ceasefire. There should be the end of occupation. I think that's pretty, I don't know. Is that radical? I don't know. Spoken out against anti-Semitism, I've condemned everything. I condemn myself, I condemn Hamas, I condemn Hezbollah, I condemn chocolate hummus. I've literally condemned everything. 1-800-CONDEMNATHON, ask me, send me money, I'll condemn everything. On television, still not enough. Uh, I've been boycotted by some Muslims and Palestinians because I engage with Jews. So here I am being boycotted by Muslims and Palestinians. Now I'm being boycotted by some folks, liberals. I've lost opportunities, I lost a hosting gig. And, and speaking about the wings being clipped, you know, I had this conversation with my wife. I'm like, I'm 43. I've done all this stuff. Yeah. I've come so far. And wow, man, my wings are clipped. And then I thought about it. I was like, I wasn't depressed, but I was like kind of down. But I'm like, you know, that's life. You got to innovate. Yeah. The industry is changing. Those opportunities are gone. I'm like, I've done this my entire career. And so it's an opportunity to innovate. But now that I've seen is that audiences are more aware. Audiences are more diverse the same narrative doesn't work. Kids are with you. And so you got to reach those audiences trying different means, right? Like, so it's, it's an interesting opportunity where I'm at this point in my career as a storyteller where I have to reiterate and re-innovate. And if you think about life, that's what life is. You get to the top, Allah says, you're not at the top. Let me bring you down for a second. You're like, it's all over. It's like, no, it's not over. I just brought you down to make you sore again. I really want to talk about that innovation, but also you talk a lot about pushing back and the strength, right? Yeah. And standing up for yourself, the taking two steps back to take one step forward. Can you guys talk about that pushback? What pushback have you received, especially this, these last few months, if you feel comfortable talking about it? And how are you supposed to deal with it, right? I mean, I think a lot of people have that question. How do you deal with that pushback? You got pushback for an article you wrote. I, got I get pushback all the time. I have stories, but this yeah. one, go ahead. I'm trying to figure out if I should drink some water. Um, well, I want to speak really quickly about the hope component, yeah. right? So I want to talk about how um, I was teaching in Compton, and rain was coming through the TV studio that I'm teaching at. And I'm teaching students multi-camera, because I, I was a directing intern for The Young and the Restless. And at the, I tell this story. Have I told this story publicly? how they offer me a job. And I remember walking up the steps to go meet with the producer. Because I, w one thing that I learned from being, you know, our upbringing, right, from being black and Muslim in America is just work hard, right? So I remember walking up and they offer me a job. And I remember calling my husband at the time from a phone in uh, the studio, the CBS studio. And I was like, they're gonna offer me a job. But he said, what do you wanna do? Now, this is a, new, a first marriage, a young marriage. 20 pounds smaller 20 years ago. I was like, I don't want the job. He was like, okay. So I could get away with that at that point, right? He's like, okay, yeah. So I go up, I tell him no, right? Then I make Bilali, and that's probably why I'm here on the stage, right? But I'm going to go back to the Compton component. I'm teaching at Compton High, uh, Compton uh, Community College. Rain going through the studio. Eventually, I walk by and realize they've blocked it off for asbestos. Within a year, I'm taking a story out to almost every streamer, network, no, every streaming service about that experience. Thank you. So what I mean is that I remember teaching multi-camera directing to black people in Compton and then thinking, wow, I turned down that job. <laughs> I'm in the studio range here, right? Then eventually getting 
representation, then taking a story out, pitching me being a teacher, a professor teaching in Compton as a black Muslim, and taking it out, and people popping up and being like, wow, wow, I didn't know you exist, right? So all of it, all of it is story. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? Even yeah. the struggle. So you put that, that's the innovative component. That's the hope for me. That's what I think I can share. Yeah. I, I can give you a, a concrete example real quick. And I want to make sure Khadija doesn't get fired. So I'll say all the controversial <laughs> stuff because we have to protect her uh, and put her in a bubble. But, uh, you know, I, someone asked me. Did you guys work at this jail before? No, no, no. We so didn't, didn't actually. I mean, you know, look, I told you build alliances, right? No, <laughs> no but... Uh, I'll give an example. I, I mentioned very briefly in the opening that I wrote this report on Islamophobia years ago. And I, I did not want to do that. Like, you know, as Amina said, I just wanted to tell stories. But at that moment, you know, our Muslim brother Obama was uh, running for president for the second time. Oh, you didn't know? You didn't know? Now you know. Uh, and so, you know, the way the life works out, because I wrote the place, this think tank said, can you, like, map out who's coming up with all these Islamophobic conspiracy theories? That report became a foundational report. So unfortunately or fortunately, I've had to spend a lot of time on the intersection of Islamophobia with anti-Semitism and anti-black hatred. I was trying to warn people about the rise of white nationalism for 12 years. No one took me seriously. And so I was about to give this lecture to a whole bunch of attorneys and judges in New York. They had me. And at the last second, they said, two people have complained on your retweets. No. They sent me the tweet. I'm like, did I say something, Cray? I'm like, I looked at it. No, nothing Cray. Just retweeted something against Netanyahu and retweeted a Jewish American scholar who talked about genocide. That was like, oh, people are uncomfortable. Yeah. And so it reminded me of the post 9-11 environment where people are proactively self-censoring uh -huh. out of fear. I lost another gig that they had me for six months, said some people are uncomfortable with you. The some people is always two or three people. Proactively. Or, or, or two, yeah, exactly. Self-censoring. Yeah. I lost a potential hosting gig where overnight they did 180. And both my agents are like, we have never seen that. And I'm like, okay, because you, you gaslight yourself as a person of color. Maybe I'm being too sensitive. Maybe I'm being crazy. And you're like, I don't think I am. And then those two people are like, that was hella weird, man. And then things went dry. like, how many Muslim clients do you have? Right? And then my agent told me, I hope I don't get them in trouble, that it's not just Muslims and Arabs, but they have seen that their clients even for retweeting certain things. So that's media. My friend, I'll say it openly, Mehdi Hassan, lost his gig because he pushed back hard, right? Uh, in law, I can tell you that I went and gave uh, speeches uh, to uh, corporate law firms, and the DI team says the Muslims and Arabs and even some Jewish Americans are afraid to even say ceasefire. In medicine, I could tell you my wife's a doctor. So across industries, People are self-censoring themselves. And it's just, not just Muslims and Arabs, also Jewish allies. And you know, Melissa Barrera, you all know Melissa Barrera. They literally, like, Scream was a lucrative franchise. And they're like, we're going to fire Melissa Barrera for literally resharing an article written by a Jewish-American scholar on genocide. And they fired her. And then Jenny Ortega is like, peace. Uh, and then people are like, oh, shit, this actually hurt us because we lost Scream 3. So I'm just, keep, I'm just being honest. It reminds me of the post-9-11 climate. But the difference this time is there are allies who realize this is bad for Jews, bad for Muslims, bad for Arabs, bad for democracy, bad for peace, bad for Israel and Palestine. And you're seeing a pushback now in March. But in the last five months, a lot of talent lost opportunities. Should Muslims even be telling their own stories? There are two very prominent people who have called me and said, you know, maybe just this is a raging fire. Stay away from it. You're going to get burned. Should they even be doing that? Yeah, I, I think so. I think we should be telling our own stories because I think it doesn't mean that someone else shouldn't tell our stories as well, right? That's the alliances. That's the building the coalition. But I do think that we shouldn't shy away from our own stories. It's our story. And to be quite frank, if we're not telling the story, is the story even going to be told appropriately? Um, so I think that we, we can't this, – there's a – and I, I think I know where you're going – Zarings, I think you're, you know, look, how do we get other people to be a part of this with us? And I think that's important. But that they shouldn't talk for us exclusively. Whenever I've seen that happen in history, I don't think that we've been represented in the exact light that we want to be represented in. And so I think that we have to be really careful about obfuscating the role and the duties that we have to tell our own stories. But I think at the same time, like, you know, you know, the reality is, is that, yes, 
there's a lot of folks who are afraid. There are a lot of people who are afraid to walk into doors every single day in every industry. I think you're absolutely right. I'm actually an executive champion for Salam at Disney, the Walt Disney Company, which is the, the business employee resource group. And so I spend a lot of time with the leaders of Salam and also the membership of Salam talking about these issues. Um, and I also spend a lot of time with corporate leaders talking about this issue. And, um, and in that work that I do, what I am trying to do is communicate to the corporation, right, the importance of not just the, the voices of Muslim Americans or the voices of Arab Americans or the voices of allies in this space, but for them to win their hearts and have them understand exactly what the experience is that people feel every single day. When we have people in our in organization um, who have lost 72 members of their family in Palestine, it's a problem, right? So how do, we, how do we speak to the organization so that they understand the human condition and the human toll this is taken on people as a part of the Walt Disney Company? Those, those are big things. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the front lines in some ways and I'm on the backside in other ways, really. But the work that we do and the, um, and the, 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 the way in which we connect with people, I think, at this moment is really important. And the way that we speak about these issues is really crucial, too. And so we have to be really intentional and purposeful and very strategic, I think, right? Um, but at the same time, there, like I said before, there are people who come to me and ask me questions and just say, Khadija, you know what? I don't want to sound ignorant, but, you know, can you take me to the mosque with you? Can you take me to the masjid with you? I actually want to see Jumar Priya. I actually want to sit with you. I actually want to understand what's happening. That's powerful. That, that dawah, that propagation, that understanding and explanation um, of what, what is happening to our community is really important. And so we should welcome other people to hear us and to be with us in these moments. I think it's really important. And so um, that's the work I think that we still have to do as well, even though everything else is happening and it seems like the world's on fire. But there is that opening oftentimes for other people to sit with us, and we have to welcome them into those spaces, I think. And I think it's really important for us in terms of how we thrive long term. I think couple minutes I've left, but you touched on something perfect. I mean, the non-Muslims, right? And I'm so glad they're approaching Welcome you. Welcome, non-Muslims. For help. And we have some of them here, We will right? be converting all of you uh, in seven <laughs> minutes. Just line up to the right. Tell him he should become a comedian, right? <laughs> Salvation and food will be delicious. I'm just kidding. So just kidding. Last Welcome all. Here. Um, you know, why should non-Muslims care? And how can non-Muslims help us? Amina, you go first. I was going to... To, you know, do my little dance. So what I wanted to say was, um, this is what I teach, and so I want to talk strategy, right? So we're coming up on our fast, and you don't have to be Muslim to fast, right? You just call it, non-Muslims call it intermittent fasting, right? <laughs> <But> Wellness. <laughs> so you're already Muslim. Um, so I'm thinking about how we engage and how we can be productive in a way that helps support Muslims, even if you, it's just, a, it's, this is a human, a human uh, condition, right? So the reality is um, you can fast from things that don't show Muslims in the light that you think they should be shown it. I'm not saying that Muslims have to be shown all positive. I know some bad Muslims. <laughs> But what I'm saying is that we can get our stories out. We can get stories that help support, you know, Muslims out by you fasting from the ones that don't show and support Muslims in a way that you think is positive, right? Not that the stories have to always be perfect, right? So strategy is this. You don't, if you go into a movie and it shows anybody, they don't just have to be Muslim, but anybody in a way that is not, you know, kosher, aesthetic, Right? You can walk out and demand your money back. I tell my students that. Wait, do they give you your money back for that? I get my money back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. But I'm just saying, you can fast from the things that aren't, not just food, fast from the things that aren't supporting and pushing you forward. Support, support, support the ones that are, right? Support, support, support the ones that are. Also, I got brought in to be my own showrunner. So support, if you're an executive, bring people in. I'm like, hi, I'm going to be a showrunner. But they pair you with somebody who's an experienced showrunner, show right? Uh -huh. But what you do is, if you're an executive or somebody that can, you know, do that, you want to, for allyship, you have to, if you're going to tell Muslim stories, you got to put a Muslim in the center of it. You can't put them on the side. Okay, we have a few minutes left. So what do you guys think? Okay, uh, so... 
there's a cost to silence. And I understand the strategy because I was told this, just keep low. And uh, the same thing after 9-11, I remembered that you know, just, just stay out of it and you'll survive. But there is a spiritual cost, a moral cost, a creative cost to silence. Uh, you feel like you, you drown yourself, right? And uh, I remember, this is for the storytellers here, right? Because you're like, I don't know, I'll, I'll self-censor myself. And Amin and I were talking about this just like an hour and a half ago while we were getting our tickets. We're like, remember after 9-11, uh, you know, Dixie Chicks were like the whitest women on earth who had like the number one tour, pop country crossover. All Natalie Main said was, I'm embarrassed that George W. Bush is from Texas. Bye, y'all. That's all she said. Yeah. And they boycotted her and banned her and took tractors over their CDs. CDs, children, yeah. are compact discs. They're a means <laughs> by which us cavemen used to listen to music. And if you liked a girl, you'd burn a CD for her and give it to her. Not me, but some of my friends. But, and I remember at that time, me and I were talking about it. I came out with my play. She was coming out with a movie. And we're like, if this is what they did to the Dixie Chicks, what the hell are they going to do to us? Yeah. And giving the example of Melissa Barrera, if they're going to destroy Melissa Barrera's career, like what are they going to do to us? You wrote a great article, by the way, about Amy Schumer. That the was, double standards, right? That I think you got some heat for. But yeah, yeah. But, but I'm saying is, I think about that, and I'm like, I'm glad I spoke out. You know, I wrote that play. That play became foundational for my career. And I need to speak out. You know, history will be a, a witness. I need to as mention well. Paul Robeson. They erased Paul Robeson literally from history for speaking out. So. And now he's not, but now people brought him back, right? So why should you do it? It's because as a storyteller, think about it. Think about the cost. That's the answer you can only ask, ask yourself. Number two, the power of storytelling, as studies have shown, creates empathy. So I know that, this, you know, do you care about humanity? Do you care about empathy? Do you care about knowing your fellow person? Do you care about becoming a better person? Storytelling helps that. Number three, we're fighting for this thing called democracy right now in America. And what people are realizing, it's a multiracial democracy. They're coming after all of us. Thanos is white supremacy. And finally, people are realizing, oh, I have to stand up for Muslims and black folks and Latinos and women and the gays. The transgenders also, right? Because this thing called democracy is under threat. And then finally, number four, the color green. Every single data point shows that when you have more diverse stories and more diverse characters in those stories, the TV show gets more ratings, the, money, the movie makes more money, the books sell more. So if you care about a global market and you care about this thing called money, it is in your interest to invest in all of our stories. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> On that note, Sue, you're telling me to wrap, is that right? <laughs> questions, all right, let's go to questions. Who's got one? Bueller. Anyone, Sue, you got a question? Oh, you have one right there. Um, personally, since you've, uh, well, I'm glad, since you've had these experiences, and, and this goes to all of you, where uh, speaking out has uh, led you to maybe losing opportunities how do you personally uh, prevent that from colonizing your mind in the future? Mm. To consider, like, are you are you at this point reconsidering some of the retweets that you're doing for your career, uh, for the advancement of, of your career, uh, rather than just, you know, is, is there a, yeah, yeah, of course. Is, is there a little question. bit of hesitation? That's a great question, yeah. I have an answer. Oh, he asked you a direct question, but I, but I can, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you answer it first. But I, I'll let you answer it first and I'll go afterwards. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But I uh, if there's something where I feel like I have, you know, it's, it's about personal integrity and morals. If I feel like I've offended someone or if I said something that I really feel that I, I shouldn't have said, I'll apologize. I want to be humble enough to apologize. If I feel like I'm apologizing for my convictions, if I feel like I have to performatively apologize or take it back and... You could feel it. You feel like you're giving a piece of your soul away. Yeah. That's why I say no. And that's why I say I'll stand by it. If that even means I fall, I fall. And what I have seen is that doors have closed throughout my entire career. Like my own communities are boycotting me as we speak. And what I saw is with allies, other doors open. Yeah. Other doors have always opened. And so I've been very lucky. I made a strategy early on. I was in my late 20s. I'm like, I will write what I want to write, how I want to write. I will write at a prolific clip. I'll make it quality to the point where they can't ignore me. And then whoever wants to come play with me will come play with me. Another analogy, I'll play in my playground. And whoever says, I like how this guy's playing, they'll be my natural allies. I don't need everyone else. And that's okay. You can just go on by. 
but you can't deny me my place in the playground. And what I found out is that the type of energy and stories I've put in the world, the universe has reciprocated. I've gotten those allies, those opportunities, those people who believe in me, those people who say, I, I, I read what you wrote. I really like it. Oh, I saw you on TV. Uh, and then those people are the ones who have invested in me. And that, that way, I felt that I've never sold out. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great answer, actually. I was just going to add real quick that I think the thing that we have to also remind ourselves of is that we have to have faith, right? Faith is so core to what, not just what we do, but who we are, right, as a people. And so if we believe that what we've done is the right thing, right, if we stand by how we are showing up in the world, what, we, what our convictions are, how we are to move through the world, and that's who we truly are, and, and that's all our authentic selves, we have to stick with that. We have to be that person, right? Because the one thing that you don't want to do is ever give up something of yourself for something else that really is not truly demonstrative of who you truly are, and that you look in the mirror and you don't see yourself. So I would say that, yeah, you might not get the gig, you might lose three jobs, but there are doors that will open for you. And there are, more importantly, there are things that you will be able to create. Your innovation, my mother used to say, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. When you don't have things, you figure some things out. That box becomes 10 other things we talked about, right? That box becomes like the car, the house, the school. You know, you don't, that's all you had. That was like, we had one box in our house. So we played with the box and it would be like, oh, it's all these things. Your imagination runs wild. So when you don't have a lot of other things in front of you, you start to create things and you start to become more innovative. So think of it that way, that you're never without um, creativity is in you, but more importantly, you're never without options. You always have options. The only thing I'll add to that is, you know, it depends on what your goal is, right? If you're, if you're ill alive, if your goal, if you're, if you're, you know, center of universe is, is green, then you may regret those things, right? I think about my father who on one day took me into a pitch meeting, shook a hand on a deal for a film. We walk out. My dad's on television protesting the very company that he just shook the deal, his hand, on, on, and I'm like, Daddy, we, don't do it. He's already, he already did it. He already did it. We lost the, we lost the job, right? I was so, but the reality is one of the wisest, one of the wealthiest people I know is my daddy. And I'm just saying, you got to stand on business. The young kids call it standing on business. Sometimes you got to really stand on the business. So I have a little bit of a tougher question. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just going to waste it. Ask it. Yeah. I, I really like it. So uh, my name is Muzaffar Shah Khan. Uh, I am the son of ambitious Muslim immigrants from Hyderabad, India. Uh, I am a entrepreneur, delusional dreamer. Um, I'm a comedy talk show host and a dental implant surgeon from Chicago. Oh, wow. So that's my background. Um, I just want to share a quote with you guys. A brother Malcolm X said, if you're not careful, the newspapers or the media will have you hating the people who are oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. Another quote from Muhammad Ali, I declare support for the Palestinian struggle to liberate their homeland and oust the Zionist invaders. So, like, I know that you all work in the news. Um, you're definitely, like, an inspiration. Not all. Yeah. Um, a couple of us. You know, like, so it's, it's really great to see similar faces and all of that. I mean, certainly you're, like, a big inspiration. But I can just tell you from, like, you know, like, someone on the outside, mm -hmm. right? Like, major media, right? Like, news. I have not watched the news since October, Okay myself and my colleagues, right? Specifically, these big networks, CNN, all of that. Because I consistently hear untruths, right? I hear a lot of Zionism. I hear Islamophobia. It's like rampant, right? And the thing is, I'm not, I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm not like a simple guy, right? I'm a highly educated, very high net worth individual. And so are a lot of my colleagues, right? And there's like thousands of you know, and it's just like, you know, we're working, we're the ones running these big clinics, doing these huge surgeries, like running hospitals, 
and like, you know, they can't even say something minor for humanity, right? I own my own stuff, so I can say whatever I want, okay? And I have, and I've had a lot of people come after me. On November 7th, I got 250 phone calls to my clinics, okay? And they're not from black people, okay? They weren't from Asian people. They were from one group of people, okay? Coming after me, coming after my business that I built myself. And I was just like, okay, if this is happening to me, you know, and I have resources. I have a lot of stuff that other people don't have, you know? And it's just like my colleagues and everyone, they're just like so scared to say anything, you know? And a lot of it is, unfortunately, it is caused by major media because, like, I know who's at the top of major media. I'm, I'm grateful to Allah, honestly, for you. You know, like, it's great that you're there. But, like, all of the messages that are going out, like, that's what's causing problems. And, like, one more thing. Doctor, doctor can, can we ask the question? Is yeah, no, I'm, I'm, no, no, I, I know, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Yeah, so, you. you know, I'm, so I, I was going to lead to that. So, uh, you know, Wadia Al-Fayyum, right? He was a six-year-old boy who was murdered in Chicago. He was stabbed 30 times, okay? And the reason he was stabbed by his accuser is because his accuser was like a 75-year-old man who was fed lots of information regarding Islamophobia. So he felt that, like, this is what he had to do, right? So I went to that funeral. Like, I don't live in Gaza. I don't live in Palestine. I live in Chicago, you know? And, like, because of what's out there, that's what's influencing all of these people. So, you know, my, my, my question to you is, like, I... It's great. There's a lot of great things happening, but there's so much bad stuff happening, you know? And it's like, it's like crazy, you know? Like even for me, like it's hard for me to work and run my businesses. Like I should be in my clinic doing surgery right now, not even being here. And so it sounds like the question is, what you, what, does it make a difference? Does having a few people actually make a difference, right? Like, what, like there needs to be a change. So it's like, what, what's going to happen so, like, there's some positivity and not, like, rampant Islamophobia in the media? I, I think there's I – mean, look, there's a lot of it. I, when, you, when you watch the news, I know it's – look, you're probably getting fed a lot of clips on social media that, that go with a certain point of view, perhaps. But there's a lot of – the, the side of the, um, you know, the, the conflict that, that you're talking about, right? And, and the biggest challenge I think we face is we can't get any reporters inside that, that area. But also to all of your points, this is a big change from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, right? Like pre-9-11, the coverage is changing. Um, but I'll let you guys you know, so speak on that as well. Can I say very quickly, military solutions haven't worked. They won't work. I think we could see that now. Uh, people who think that any group is going to go away, no one's going to go away. Palestinians are going to go away. Jews aren't going to go away. The future of Israel and Palestine is intertwined. Uh, hopefully, I think people are realizing that uh, a diplomatic solution and better leadership is needed. Uh, this is my personal opinion, not the opinion of anyone else uh, on, this, uh, on this panel. Uh, when it comes to media, post-1967, uh, America has become allied with Israel. It's the closest partner. As such, it's, it's, not just, it's just not just political, it's foreign policy. Also, you have to realize uh, cultural investment, economic investment, right? And as such, that's been the narrative. It's been a single narrative. And Palestinians in particular have struggled to tell their narrative. Now, the disruption, real quick, and what uh, uh, Zorin is saying, what's different this time around, is thanks to social media, thanks to TikTok, for better and for worse, thanks to a globalized media, these stories are being told. And Americans are seeing what I think is just daily carnage, right? 30,000 people have been killed uh, after Hamas brutally attacked, 12, killed 1,200 people, and there's still hostages. If you look at the, the, the dynamics, for young people in America, when it comes to quote-unquote pro-Palestinian, whatever that means, it's 60-30, 65-35, a complete reversal of those who are older who were fed legacy media. Legacy media now has to, essentially change and adapt to the global population, the pressure. You're seeing also the uncommitted vote in Minnesota and Michigan, right? So you're seeing systems of power that have been entrenched now forcing to change and adapt, not just when it comes to this issue, 
black people, women's rights, right? So when you're, what you, your frustration is a real frustration, but that frustration, I think, is shared by a young, changing, more aware, globalized community that says, we need parity. And I will say this, and I'll end on this, I know we're out of time, that when it came to people asking for more talks on Islamophobia in law firms in corporate America, you know who made the call in the last three months? Wasn't Muslims and Arabs. Was non-Muslim, non-Arab colleagues who were like, all right, you did a, a panel on anti-Semitism in Israel that was good. What about Muslims and Arabs? And then I got the call. So it's easy to be frustrated and angry and self-defeating, and I get it. I get the frustration. But I want to tell you, if I may, look at black folks in America. This isn't new. You have to have hope. You have to have resilience. You have to keep pushing. And I will say again, no one's going back. Uh, and thank you for asking that question. I know it was really hard. But I'm going to have to speak for black people. What we did was we protested. What we did was we stopped mm -hmm. supporting what didn't support us. And the I other think we thing, had to wrap. I, yeah, oh, we have sorry, to wrap. I would just tell you one thing also. Yes. In the rooms, to your point, are people who are also frustrated, right? right? And so when we walk into places every day and we have to deal with and we have to fight for and we have to speak up on behalf of, it doesn't mean that we're not frustrated. It just means that we're showing up every day to do the work. And so despite our frustration, despite how we might feel, we have to put our suits on, not our capes. Sometimes you don't have a cape. Sometimes I don't wear a cape. Every, sometimes I do, but sometimes I don't. But when I don't have a cape, I still have to show up. And so I think we have to continue to show up. That's the key. And, and for those who want to convert, for those who want to convert right here. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate you.